Okay, thanks, Yuri, uh, for the invitation. This is, this is going to be fun for me. I just came from, uh, I don't know if any of you were at the, the CEO of the Gates Foundation was here today speaking, and she said the key to innovating is to make sure you keep yourself a little bit uncomfortable. So this is me being uncomfortable, because I, um, I haven't taken a CS class in my life, and here I am lecturing in CS 500 or whatever this is. Um, so what I'll talk about today is um, sort of how at, in my group and in the Center on Food Security, we have a Center on Food Security Environment here for, at Stanford, for those who didn't know that, um, how we're starting to think about, and now we have been thinking about using data towards the, the questions that we have. And I'm starting with this picture, which is actually a picture of where I did most of my work during my PhD, which was, let's say, 10 years ago, uh, a little bit more now. Um, and what you see here is a typical scene in a, um, in a developing country, especially in, a, in an area where there's lots of active research. So uh, I don't have a pointer, I don't think. But these little squares, like you can see right above the title there, these are little experimental plots. And this is sort of the, the MO of agricultural research in the world is if you have a question about which, which varieties work best, which practices work best, and I'll get into a little more detail, you run, a, you run an experimental trial. Um, your sample size is typically 20, say, you replicate, you know, five treatments four times or something, and you draw your conclusion. And, and when I was visiting in, early on in my PhD, um, you know, I, I saw these very cool things, and this was actually the, the home of Norman Borlaug. If anyone, has anyone here heard of Norman Borlaug? Okay, so it's something to Google after, uh, not right now, after the session. Um, and it seemed very interesting, but it also, to me, seemed like a tremendous waste, because here you have thousands and thousands of farmers all around you performing these in, in some ways, experiments, but they're not controlled experiments. And, and there was no real insight being gained from that. It was all based on this basically very um, small fraction of land where it, controlled experiments were doing. So I, um, I set about during my PhD trying to understand how can we actually measure what farmers are doing and learn more from what farmers are doing. And that has been, um, in, in some ways, the story of my career so far. It has not progressed maybe as quickly as um, as a lot of applications in data science do, because collecting data in agriculture is, and, and in, in the area of food security in general is pretty hard. So I'll talk today um, about a few things. Um, I'm going to start off talking just uh, you know, assuming that you guys haven't really thought about food security. You probably are thinking it's food security, like food contamination. Is that what you're talking about? That's the most common question I get. Food security, we just mean basically you know where your next meal is coming from, or you know that maybe you don't know which restaurant you're going to go to, but you know that you're going to get fed. Um, it's, it's basically the opposite of chronic hunger or chronic insecurity. And um, it's, it's still a big issue in the world, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, but, but briefly. And then I'll talk about, just in general terms, where we see kind of the vision of data fitting into these, um, these challenges of feeding the world. I'll talk a little bit about the current state of data, which is probably not going to impress those of you who are used to working with, um, you know, billions and billions of data points. But, but it's getting there, and it's um, exciting, I think. And then I'll talk about some of our own research in kind of the few examples, what I'll think of as kind of scratching the surface of what's possible, where we do have pretty rich data environments, what we're doing with that. And, um, and then I'll talk about how we're trying to improve the richness of the data and maybe point out some things where we could definitely use help from, from, uh, from those of you who know more about um, data sets, algorithms, et cetera. OK. So with that, how do you think about food security? Well, I think of it really as a three-fold challenge. And the, what makes it tough is, is that it's the combination of these things. So the first element of the challenge is that we have to produce a lot of food. We have now 7 billion people in the world. We're going towards 9 billion people in the world. We have issues of resource scarcity, like groundwater depletion. We have issues of climate change. Uh, lots of things challenging our ability to keep up uh, with feeding the world. And in doing that at a low cost. And low, Low cost is really important because of the levels of poverty in many parts of the world. It's not always a good thing to have cheap food, right? It leads to lots of waste. It leads to um, obesity. I'm not saying anyone here is, but uh, you know, in, in our community, we, especially this time of year, we tend to figure out you know, how do we eat less food? How do we, how do we um, prevent ourselves from taking advantage of such cheap food? But, but as you, I'm sure, can believe, that's a big deal in a lot of parts of the world. Spending half your income or more on food is, is, means that it's important to keep the cost low. The second element, though, is that it's really important to engage with smallholders around the world. So you might think of a solution, why don't we just you know, make everything, in, uh, go into every community and, and bring the most advanced, sophisticated farming practices, which 
generally will involve mechanization and, and running large units of operation. That's not going to work because most of the poor, most of the food insecure in the world are smallholders, and you have to kind of work with them because if you're just producing food without helping them generate income, you're not going to solve the problem because th those are the ones who need the income and the food to be able to be food secure. And then finally, if, if you were just doing those two, you might think about how to do it by expanding land a lot or by using lots and lots of resources. But we also want to do this in a way that protects the environment. Um, and this is, I think, well, it is the, really the theme of our Center on Food Security and the Environment. It's about meeting both of these goals. And I think one thing that people don't quite appreciate is how, in some ways, how remarkably successful we've been in protecting the environment in agriculture. Here's just a quick kind of summary of the world in agriculture. Um, historically, at least the last 50 years, we've more than doubled the amount of food produced. We produce over 2 billion tons of grain a year now, a lot of food. Um, but we do that, as is indicated on the right there, we've had this tremendous increase, but 90% of that has come from the land that was already in agriculture in 1960. So we've been tremendously successful at increasing the productivity of that land, which is really important because Although we've had some deforestation, we could have had far, far more deforestation. And looking forward at the, at the projected increases in demand, which range from about 50 to 100%, which is why I have those two points there. So ranging from basically a linear, linear extrapolation to even more than that. If you want to meet that by expanding agricultural land, you're talking about major uh, loss of native habitat. And also, if you're, if you're talking about meeting that by heavily increasing uses of water or nutrients or chemicals, you're talking about major environmental impacts. So trying to achieve those goals using the minimum amount of land and resources that we can is really the, the challenge. And doing that in a way that engages smallholders and raises their incomes and, and productivity. That's, in a nutshell, the challenge. And we still, as much as we've had success, we still have a long way to go in the sense that nearly a billion people um, are chronically food insecure. And that's a very kind of generous or, let's say, conservative definition of food security in that you have enough to basically sit around all day. Um, if you want to be active in any way, you actually, that number would go up quite a bit. Um, there's lots of inefficiencies in this system, and this happens really in any way you look at it. But if you look at, for example, how much we get out of a unit of land, it's typically less than 3 quarters, often less than half of what we know is possible if you manage it really, really well. Um, and and another manifestation of that is we know that about half of the fertilizer applied to crops is not taken up by the crops. It's either staying in the soil somewhere, it's, it's going into the atmosphere, it's leaching into waters, causing all sorts of eutrophication and other issues, uh, groundwater contamination, et cetera. So lots of inefficiencies in the system. And, um, and this is kind of the, the opportunity here. We have lots of um, big challenges, lots of current inefficiencies. Um, so that's kind of the, the overall challenge. But what are the kind of specific questions that we don't know the answers to that we would like to know the answers to? And I want to set this um, up as a pretty wide range, because the world of food security, the world of food production ranges from really poor, poor smallholder who are really um, not able to take on any sort of risk, because risk to them really means not getting through the year. Um, so it's very hard for them to, say, make investments in technologies that probably will have a very beneficial effect if there's some risk involved. All the way up to, say, a US very sophisticated farmer who's basically sitting in their cab as their tractor drives itself and is doing all sorts of sophisticated things. And he's got all sorts of insurance backing him up. He's, he's managing very large units of land. So the big questions in, in agriculture and in food security general um, are not the same everywhere. There, there's definitely going to be a lot of context uh, dependence. But at the same time, there's kind of some commonality to the types of questions. And I would say the big questions are generally, how do you answer a lot of little questions? And what I mean by that is, if you're a farmer, for example, you want to know what crop should I be planting? When should I be planting it? Uh, what variety should I be choosing? When should I be fertilizing? What time of year? How much should I be fertilizing? All of these little questions. Um, add up to lots of, lots of decisions that farmers are making all the time. And that's true across, across the spectrum. The other thing to, to really appreciate, I think, is that it's not just farmers in the world of agriculture, in the world of food security. They are important, obviously. They're, they're, they're central. But there's all sorts of other decision makers, all sorts of other people who are making decisions that are potentially informed by data science. So for example, for researchers or companies, this is more the scale that I interact with. Um, 
is, you know, in breeders, what, they want to know what should they be targeting, what, what kind of traits would really be useful once they get out into the farmer's fields beyond their small experimental plots. Um, what the agronomists want to know is what is, what should I be telling the farmers of how they manage? Should they be, you know, spacing their plants this far apart or this far apart? And they should they be growing two per row or three per row? Per row? All these kind of very technical type of questions. Um, they don't know very good answers, or they have some idea of the answers, but there's lots of uncertainty. Um, adoption of technology is a big issue in, in development in general, but especially in, in agriculture. If you have a technology you know will work, how do you how do you incentivize the farmer properly to take that up? And then at another scale, you have policymakers. And policymakers generally want to know uh, what they need to do in the short term. I mean, that's kind of the general theme of policymakers. And that can include things like if you're in, a, let's say, a poor African country that's an importer of food, uh, what does my crop look like this year? How much do I have to make sure that I can secure on the markets so that my people are, um, are fed? Uh, to things like in the US and the policymakers, they want to know, how should our subsidies look? What should our um, insurance products look like? Are we incentivizing the wrong things? Is there better things that we can be doing? All these, these people have important roles to play. Um, and, and I think the, we interact with all of them. I think personally, I interact, as I said, mostly with the people who are developing the technologies, not just the crops, but all the technologies. What's actually going to be effective? And this is something that we can help address with, with data science. So I'm going to try a rough analogy here, um, just because I know that a lot of you are familiar with all sorts of other applications, not so much agriculture. And one that Yuri and I and, and some others talked about a while back was, was education and the role of data science in education. So I would say that, you know, and I should say, I know students prefer not to be compared to vegetables or, or, to, uh, or to livestock being led to slaughter or something like that. But I think educating students is actually a lot like growing food in that you have lots and lots of different factors involved. So there's all sorts of multivariable um, issues going on here. That effect sizes tend to be pretty small for any individual factor. So if you have a small kind of trial, it's very hard to see the effects. Um, there's lots of ignorance about what actually works. That doesn't mean you, people won't tell you they know it works. But um, there's just, because of the first two factors, there's lots of uncertainty about what we should actually be doing. And, and as a result, there's lots of, um, inefficiencies in the system, as I already said, because of this imperfect knowledge. And there's also a lot of heterogeneity. There's lots of variation between how it, one individual will respond to a certain type of instruction um, or, or lecture or whatever versus uh, another one. There's a lot of difference in how a particular farmer or a particular soil or um, a particular crop will respond versus others. So there's all sorts of variation. And ideally, what we would like is a system that's very responsive and very um, individualized. So we would like to not just say, this region should be applying 100 kgs of nitrogen, and they should be planting on November 15th. We would like to be able to say, well, if you're in this particular situation, this soil type, here's what you should do, and try to be more nuanced. Or in the case of precision agriculture, which is a term many of you have heard, what we'd like to be able to say is, OK, this unit of land should be getting this. Go over two steps. This unit of land should be getting this. And that, that, those sophisticated tractors I show you, that's what they're starting to do. Um, but we'd like to be able to do that, you know, this very small holder land versus this very small holder land, um, not just having these blanket recommendations, which is pretty much how it's done. Just like in education, we have sort of best practices on average, but that misses a lot of the heterogeneity. Um, and the other thing that I think is very common, although maybe less common now, is that these historically have been pretty data poor environments. And in similar ways in that, they're not necessarily that there isn't a lot of data out there. So, you know, educators have records of how well their students did, and they have some record of what they, you know, how they instructed. Farmers often have records of how they did, and they have records of what they did, but it's not aggregated in any meaningful way. It's all on paper somewhere, or it's in somebody's computer, but because of privacy concerns or just because of technological issues, um, People like me, researchers or policymakers, are generally working in a data poor environment historically, but that but that's changing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna probably overuse this analogy as we go through, but that's that's sort of a comparable situation, I would say. Um, now the current state of data in 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 the world of food varies a lot across the spectrum, as you can imagine. So on the right end of the spectrum, the most sophisticated farmers are generally right now keeping very detailed records both about what they're doing and about 
what the productivity of their systems are on a meter by meter basis in some cases. That's sort of the one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, and actually most of the spectrum, is, is a far cry from that. And to give you a sense of that, I'm going to show um, some data from somewhere very close to here in Kenya, which is um, a colleague here, Marshall Burke, has, has worked a long time in. And this is just some survey data. So the general way that people collect data in these systems is to go out and ask farmers about what they've been doing and what they've um, been producing. And this shows you what they report in terms of production for their field. So this would be, in this case, how many bags, how many 90 kilogram bags did you produce in your field? And what you should notice here is that this is a very lumpy histogram. And it's not that just magically they all ha happen to produce exact increments of bags. It's that they are really rounding off to the nearest 100 kgs, which is, can be a lot. Not only that, but they are then, when you ask them how much area is, is, are they producing this on, again, it's very, it's very um, rounded. Okay, So this is, if you add these two together and you're trying to measure something like productivity per unit of land, what you get is, in this case, a very fuzzy view of what's actually going on on these individual fields. And you get that only for this sample that you spend a lot of time and effort going to collect. Um, and it may be representative of some small region, but it's not something that is generally done in a very repeated fashion um, uh, in most places. So it's, it's very difficult. And it doesn't, it's not just, um, I've been talking a little bit about yields, or a lot about yields, because that's kind of what I work on. But there's other important aspects of food security that are very poorly measured. So very closely related to productivity would be the prices of food in the markets, especially in these poor areas where there's not a whole lot of interaction with the global markets. Um, prices can really fluctuate a lot. And we really have a very poor understanding of how much they fluctuate at the local scale. We often only have that understanding several weeks or months after these fluctuations happen. And that's a big deal if you're trying to target assistance and, and help avoid food insecurity. Um, at the same time, we really would like to know what are the assets involved um, at the household level? How much do people have so that you can target assistance in the right ways? People who have assets, you can try to promote or offer things that require a little risk but, but probably have a lot of return. Where people, were, where people are really poor, like if anyone's heard of Give Directly, um, you would try to just do something like unconditional cash transfers where you just basically drop cash in, in the village or in the household um, based on understanding of what the assets are. But that requires understanding um, where people are rich, where people are poor, where they have assets. And that's, uh, all these things are very poorly known. They tend to be known only in cases where we've done very slow and expensive ground surveys, things that I generally don't have the patience to do, although it, I realize how important they are. Um, uh, OK, so then that's sort of the current state of, of data in general. But I'll talk. Um, I'll talk more specifically about how that's changing in recent years and what we're doing with it. Um, OK, so back to the analogy. So what are we hoping to do? I think we're hoping to do basically the same things that we're hoping to do in education, or at least that what people tell me they're hoping to do in education, um, is to be able to very quickly identify when something works. Um, so you can see this whether, well, ideally, you're doing some sort of randomized intervention that is very easy to see cause and effect. But even without that, you can quickly see when performances are increasing and what factors were associated with that. Um, you can try to individualize things much more better, uh, much more better. As I said before, um, you can try to um, basically reverse all the inefficiencies that we talked about before. And also, you can have a much better idea of how things are changing over time so that you can either understand what's working, but also so that you can, again, target interventions. And there's all sorts of interventions in the world of food security. On the one end, there's the food aid that you see when there's big crises, but that, that, there's a whole spectrum all the way to what I was talking about with um, cash transfers trying to lift people out of poverty. OK, and, and so basically, this is what we're trying to do in agriculture um, and in food security. is very, very comparable. OK, so uh, moving on now, I want to give you a sense of what can be done when you have um, fairly big data sets. And the example I'll use is from uh, the Recent, some recent studies we've done. So we've done a series of studies in different settings with different data sets. Um, but I would say this represents kind of the biggest of the big data sets that we've worked with. This is an uh, animation here of some uh, field level insurance records that we were able to obtain through a collaboration with the USDA. So what farmers are, are yielding on their individual fields. So each of these individual points is an individual field in the three states of Iowa. Illinois and Indiana, 
um, over time. And you can see the tremendous variation that exists both across the region and over time. Um, but, I mean, we see variation in colors, but how, how, what's the difference? I'm sorry, yeah, the scale is not there. This is, this is the extent of my um, visualization capability here. Uh, the, the reds are high yielding areas and the blues are low yielding areas and there's about a factor of two difference between the highest and the lowest. Yeah, thanks Hector. So um, generally Iowa uh, is, is pretty, pretty high yielding. Generally some of these southern parts of Illinois and Indiana are less, but you can see lots of variation space and time, lots of richness here. So anyone who drives through the Midwest thinks, gosh, this is the same thing over and over and over again. I drive miles and all I see is the same thing. There's actually a lot of richness there that your eye isn't quite sensitive to because once a cornfield gets pretty good, it's really hard to see the difference between a, a really good and a really, really good cornfield. But, but there is actually a tremendous amount of difference. Uh, okay, so we can do various things depending on what other types of data sets that we have. So one of the questions that I mentioned, or, or one of the communities that I mentioned, are breeders. And what breeders really want to know uh, in, in respect to climate change is, do they need to do anything differently? Are there certain traits that would be useful, or becoming more useful, that they should really have their eye on? And one way to look at that is to try to look at what are the weather characteristics that really drive variation in yields. Seems like something we should have figured out like 2,000 years ago, in terms of we know Rain is good, right? You hear lots of things about rain being good. Um, but we want to be more sophisticated now. We want to know in a very quantitative way which factors are most important, what, you know, what specific factors, what specific time of years. So we can piece together lots. We have lots of good graded weather data in the US, station data that can be gridded, all sorts of different variables. This is just one, uh, one particular illustration of just how we compare these data. Um, this, is a, uh, this is the entire data set now plotted with a, with a lowest fit, a, a mean fit to it, just for two variables that emerge as, as fairly important. Um, the first being high daytime temperature. So Tmax is basically the hottest part of the day. What's the average hottest part of the day in this window of about July when the corn plant is flowering? And what you can see is that there's a lot of scatter, of course. Um, but you see a general tendency towards a negative effect as you get hotter. And then you see things really falling off as you get really hot. Right, hopefully um, you're convinced of that. What you see with, with rainfall, which is interesting and, and not surprising, is that you do get, as you get more rainfall during this window, it does help you. But it only helps you up to a point, and the magnitude of the effect is not nearly as big. And this, is, this was kind of a surprise because this is a rain-fed agricultural system. There's no irrigation going on. You'd expect rainfall to be really the key. But what really matters in this system, these are deep soils that generally are replenished over the, over the winter. Rainfall in the season is important, it's not trivial, but as long as it's not too low, what really matters is how fast are they burning through that store of water. And how fast they burn through that water is really a function of how hot the hottest parts of the day are. The, the, amount, uh, the ability of, of the air to suck up water, you can think of, is really nonlinear with temperature. That's why this, this feature emerges. So, so on the left, not to be contradicting you, but the blue is, is the intensity of the number of points, right? Yep. If you hadn't shown that red line and you had asked me to guess, I would have said it's, it's, it's random. I mean, it does not, I don't see well, a lot of correlation. It seems so like that, there's probably two things going on there. One is that um, it, there could have been a better color scheme to illustrate the density of points. The other is probably that our eyes are never as good as, as uh, we think they are in terms of picking out these patterns. So these are, you know, these are robust by any measure that you look at in terms of how um, these lines emerge. And one, one thing we do to look at that is we do more formal models than just these bivariate plots. So one thing we do is these multivariate regression splines. This, um, this is actually a technique I learned when I was a graduate student here in, in uh, uh, Jerry Friedman's course, but I'm sure it's kind of passe now. But they're still quite powerful in agriculture because what these do is they allow you to evaluate the data, evaluate, uh, evaluate asymmetries in the data um, in terms of, for example, with high Daytime temperature, we often use something called vapor pressure deficit, which is really a function of high daytime temperature. Um, it allows you to pick up asymmetries and nonlinearities like that. It also does a very good job of parsimo parsimonious uh, variable selection. Um, so this kind of data set was useful in the context of all this other weather data that we had in, in trying to identify what actually drives variation in this system. And in some ways, it's, it's a bit surprising compared to what people kind of thought um, based on the limited amount of data that had been used before them. 
Another thing we've done with this data set is combine it with uh, another nice product that's been coming online recently, which is the USDA uses some satellite data to map which crops are growing in which fields. And obviously with the data we had, we know if they're reporting a corn yield, we know that that field had corn. But what this allows us to do is go, what did that field have in the year prior? And what did it have in the year prior? And actually in agriculture, a lot of the, there's a lot of um, important effects of how you, of what your cropping history is. There's a lot of uncertainty about how important that is, but there's a lot of evidence that rotating is a big benefit because of all sorts of reasons. One is that the crops will be basically exploring different parts of the soil profile, so they'll be getting nutrients and water from different parts. Another big one is that they are prone to different pests and weeds, so that a pest that does really well on one crop, if you break it with another crop, it won't be there as much uh, the next year. Uh, so uh, one of the issues is that because the price of corn has been going up, at least until this year, um, there's been a tendency towards not rotating, even though it's kind of well understood that in general people should rotate. So this just shows from USDA some statistics about the, the rate of corn on corn has gone from about 10 to 15 percent. And some of the farmers will tell you that's because they can manage around this penalty. It, it requires a little bit better management, but it's not that hard to grow corn on corn. Um, another issue in this, though, is that a lot of the insurance products are actually, uh, and they're not actually incentivizing at all rotation. They're just insuring corn if you're growing corn, regardless of what your history is. So if the price of corn is higher, you're going to be that much more likely to go for corn. So what we've done is piece together a history of rotation, compared it to these nice yield data sets we have, and start to look at what are the actual benefits of different types of rotations. So you can look at corn yields following soybean, you can look at soybean following corn, you can look at corn following wheat following soybean, different, different combinations, as you can imagine, with a, with a large data set. I'll show you here just some um, initial results of corn after soybean versus corn after corn. So this is just a difference shown here by state and by year, just to give you a sense of the heterogeneity. And what you can see is a couple things. One is that there is this, on average, this very strong benefit on the order of, say, 10 or 5 bushels per acre. To give you a, a sense, average um, productivity in these systems will be about 200. So that's on the order of 3 to 5 percent. In, in agriculture, 3 to 5 percent is not a small, a small deal especially in, if you think of their margins being small, that extra 3 to 5 percent is a big deal. Um, and you can see, so that average effect, you can also see lots of heterogeneity. And this heterogeneity can be explained by things like how stressful was the environment that year. We know that, or we see at least, that rotations tend to be a bigger benefit when you're getting very stressed, maybe because of those dynamics I mentioned before with pests or with water. Um, you can see things that are a bit surprising that, you know, in terms of which soils are or are not favored by rotation. So these are the kind of questions that we're looking at now. I'm going to skip that for time. Okay, so now here's what I really wanted to talk about, which is where things are headed and where, um, and where we you know, are eager to engage with, uh, with you guys and others. Um, so there, I, the way I think of it, and, and this could be totally wrong, is that there's basically two approaches out there to try to get data rich in the sense of trying to get towards where you can do really good things with data. One is you scale up ways of existing ways of, or you find new ways of actually directly measuring what it is you want to measure. And I think in education, like the MOOCs would be a good example of this. You're, you're measuring directly you know, the performance of the students on what you want them to perform on. An example in the world of food security is, is a startup called Premise.com, which is actually using smartphones around the world to just take pictures of the prices of foods at markets and they're tagged with the location and the time, and you can begin to put together a sense of what the, um, what the prices are. Uh, but the other way you can do it is try to be clever about using proxies that are not directly what you want to know. They're probably imperfectly or, or very maybe even poorly related to what you want to know, but there is some predictive power, and that gives you the ability to get lots and lots of data with some error, which is a lot better than a little bit of data without error. Uh, the problem is, though, if we're in such data-poor environments, it's hard to actually even test or calibrate these approaches. And so we've, ha we've struggled over the years thinking about how do you find good proxies when you can't really test them that well. It's actually quite hard to publish in the scientific literature if you say we came up with a new way of measuring something. For example, in India, we, we did a lot of remote sensing, I'll show you in a second, of yields. Getting actual good field measurements of yields in India for enough of a, of a sample and number of years to be convincing is actually quite difficult. And when you do get the data, you don't necessarily 
believe it. OK, so uh, a few examples not from our work, but to give you a sense of it, of this proxy approach. Mobile phones are now being looked at as a way of tracking food security, or food consumption at least. And they've done studies in, in different countries of Africa with getting data from mobile phone providers, looking at the top up um, uh, amounts, the, the amount people are adding to their phone in a given month, and then doing detailed surveys about what they're consuming in that month. And they find that at least over space, across different people and across different villages, you get pretty good correlations between your top up expenditures and the consumption of more the, uh, the, the high end or nutritious food that's kind of a sign of, of food security. And these correlations are, are giving you a sense of what those look like. So that's definitely an encouraging thing, using just information on mobile phones themselves or from the providers to try to track. It's still an open question whether this actually provides an ability to track over time. But at least now it's, using, it's being used to look at, um, at whether it can at least pick up spatial differences. Uh, another thing that's been um, really played with a little bit, but I think has a lot of potential, is using social media like Twitter to try to track things like food prices. Um, I can imagine that this could be used for lots of things other than food prices. Um, in, in the, obviously, it is in general. But in the world of food security, things like um, bad weather events that we don't really have good data on, either because it's a place that's not really well measured, um, or there's like a hailstorm that comes through a very narrow area. But in this context, they're looking, for example, in Indonesia, at the incidence of prices, price increases in the price of rice and tweets about I don't know, whatever words you would search for. You know this more than I. But you can imagine there are things that would be associated with, with complaining about that. So that's um, another element. Then the, the big one that, that I've been focused on is using satellites. So there are, there are satellites acquiring data up the wazoo now, as you know. Um, but even going back historically, there's lots and lots of data. And what's nice about that is even, as I mentioned, even in the US, where we have really good data now being collected, not necessarily shared, but at least collected by farmers. We don't actually have it going back two decades. But if we can figure out a good way to use satellites, we can actually get a really rich history that we can look at. Um, and you can look at lots of things. So you can look at crops. Maybe that's obvious. You can see some crops there maybe more clearly. Um, but as I'll talk about in a bit, you can also look at all sorts of features of the landscape besides the crops that might be indicative of the level of assets in a community. Um, and there's all sorts of assets that we would be interested in. This is the, the high resolution kind of realm of things. Um, you can tell what crop it is from those images? Or? Well, this is, this is one of the questions. Is can you tell what crop it is? Can you tell how productive that crop is? So I'll, that's what I'm going to be talking about. OK, as I said, decades of past imagery, which is a nice addition because we can't really go back in time on a lot of the social media or other things. Um, the other thing that's really exciting is a lot of this at least coarser level data is becoming not only acquired, but it's becoming freely available. Um, it's, it's spanning more wavelengths. So radar is really useful if you're trying to see through clouds, especially in poor areas. The EU has a new, um, a new constellation that's going to include a lot of radar data that's being acquired at 30 meter resolution and provided for free. Uh, thermal data can be really useful as well. Um, and, and as I just said, it's useful for all sorts of things. But I'll talk mainly about yields. Um, and it's, and it's not easy. Let me just kind of summarize by saying it's not easy because we don't have a lot of ground truth. But what we've developed over the, the last few years is a way of, um, of trying to train algorithms without ground data. And the way we do this is to try to basically simulate hypothetical landscapes, pretend that we're looking at those as if they're real landscapes, or look at those as if they were real landscapes, train our algorithms, and then apply these algorithms to the actual data. So I'm sure there's lots of examples of this. Um, but in other fields, I'm actually not sure of that. But I think uh, it's something I picked up along the way. I don't know exactly where. Um, but what we do is we run crop model simulations. And then so a crop model simulation, just to explain a little, is you have um, a crop growing each day. It gets rain, or it, it sees sunlight, and it gets a certain temperature, and all the dynamics that we understand about crop growth. And we don't understand those perfectly, as I said. But it's captured in the model to some extent. And a crop grows over the, over the year, and then it yields something at the end of the year. And then what we can do is, at each point in time, we can look at the model and say, OK, what does a crop in the model look like? So let's say it has a leaf area of three. That's a unit that we often use, which is to say, if you collapse the crop down to the ground, how thick would, how many leaves would you have per unit area? That's a good measure of biomass. And what we know is that there's a, a very 
well-known, well-understood relationship between, say, the greenness of a plant and what it looks like from space. And this just gives you a sense of a vegetation reflectance spectrum. So as a function of wavelength, here's our visible wavelengths here. So plants are green. You guys all know that. Um, but then what happens is after they absorb red light in the near infrared, they get very reflective. And so we often use near infrared versus red or versus some normalizing wavelength as a measure of plant biomass because plants are so reflective. Much better, much easier to see variation in the near infrared than if you're driving by in a car, for example. And so um, there's been empirically evaluated in lots of different settings. This is just a plot on the right of leaf area versus a measure of greenness, which is basically ratios of, of this band four, which is a Landsat terminology, but this set of wavelengths here to this set of wavelengths here. Landsat, I should just say right now, is, is kind of the main workhorse historically of, of land remote sensing because the USGS has been putting up these satellites since the late 70s. There's lots and lots of historical data and um, it's very useful for vegetation because of this big contrast across the wavelengths that they measure. And, and the other thing about Landsat is it was a while ago now made freely available, recently has been, and I'll talk about this in a second, has been all ingested into Google's Earth Engine. And so we're using that now as a way of rapidly going through the entire archive of Landsat data. So uh, this is just a visual of what we do. Um, we simulate a particular field in a particular year with a particular management system. And then we do that and we get a final yield. And then we do that lots and lots of times. So this just shows you some selection of the, of the population we have in our, in our sim world here. Uh, lots of variation in all sorts of factors. This would be like what is actually varying when you're looking at a new scene from, from field to field or from scene to scene. And then what we do is we will then say, okay, what is the data we actually have in terms of satellite data and weather data and go in and try to look at this data set and say, okay, if we could observe, say, at these two dates, what would be our algorithm or what would be our regression basically to predict yields from what we can observe? And so we do, we, we build, right now we're just building a, a, re, a multiple linear regression where you have interactions between weather and reflectance. And that's useful for reasons having to deal with the fact that how you interpret whether, a, let's say, a very green canopy in the beginning of the season, whether you interpret that as a really good thing or not for yield depends on what you know about what the weather has been and what the weather will be because of the dynamics of, of crop growth. You don't want to run out of water at the end of the year, for example. So if you get a really dry year, having a really green uh, field in the beginning of the year wasn't such a good idea. Uh, so we build these regressions. I'm not going to get into the details of regressions. What I'll talk about is, is some empirical testing of these approaches. Um, and the nice thing is here is you can, you can swap in any sort of sensor as long as you have a relationship between what you're measuring with the sensor and what kind of ground biophysical measurement you're trying to make. So here's kind of an early prototype of this that we developed in Mexico a while back showing you uh, wheat yields in a, in, this is actually the, the satellite view of that picture I showed you in the opening slide. And you can see uh, wheat yield estimates here. I do have a scale for you. It's about a factor of two. Again, red is high yields, blue is low yields. Um, and that's a uh, comparison with farmers. We were able to get accurate data from a well-defined area that we can compare with the satellite data. Um, so this was, I think, a demonstration that you can do a pretty good job of it. Uh, and then we went on to apply this in lots of different um, uh, cases. I, I'm not going to go through them because I don't want to. Basically, this is just more of what I was talking about before, about how these can be useful. This is in India, for example, where we got to understand that distance from roads, the distance from technical advisors wasn't as important really at all as compared to something like distance to the water source. But uh, that's not what I really want to focus on. So we, um, we now can scale this up. So we were doing this on a case-by-case, -case, kind of site-by-site -site basis. Now we can really scale this up with Earth Engine. How many of you have heard of Earth Engine? Just show of hands. Okay, how many of you have heard of Google, right? You've heard of Google. Okay, they, they're good with data. They've developed this platform for working with all sorts of gridded data products. And that is actually started as their contribution to deforestation monitoring, but it's now expanding. Uh, and we've been using this, implementing our algorithms in Earth Engine so that we can scale up. And this is just showing you some initial tests we've done in, th in these three states I was showing you the data for before. So the idea is here to test it where we're data rich, where we actually have something to test against. But then to scale it so that we can apply it in all parts of the world, in all crops, in different places. Now, whether you're impressed with these, so these are the comparisons of what we're estimating. 
versus what we're observing. And since I can only reach this one, I'll, I'll talk about this one because it looks pretty good too. Um, we, do, we do a decent job. Whether you look at this and say that you could do much better or, or it's good depends, I think, on the application. And I tend to think of, as I said before, lots of data of mediocre quality is really powerful. Okay, that's kind of, I would say, one of the models of data science in general. So I'm very pleased when I see um, some correspondence. Agronomists look at this and say, oh, your R squareds are not 0.95. How could you ever, how could you ever use this? But I think that's their problem in terms of understanding the, the power of what we're doing or what the data science can do. So I would say overall this gets a passing grade. Um, it's, it's really early days. So we haven't even, for example, correctly filtered out the clouds yet. This is one of the things I'll mention is actually filtering out clouds is not so hard. Filtering out cloud shadows is something that um, the community is still struggling with. And if you want to really scale up and you're in places that have clouds because they're growing crops and they're getting rain, it can be a, an important thing to, sh to filter out cloud shadows. Okay, so that, um, and I just want to talk a little bit about extension of that, not just spatially, but into other sensors. And it's fairly trivial from, from a standpoint of swapping in one sensor for another. But what it really transforms is our ability to look at the poorest places of the world. Because historically, we've had Landsat data, which is shown on the right here for, a, for that uh, area of Kenya, which I showed you a picture of on the ground before. Whereas it, you need really something like a one meter resolution data to really be able to pick out individual fields, individual houses. And what, um, how many of you have heard of Skybox is another survey question. Okay, Skybox has now actually been acquired by Google, but they have a new approach to, to acquiring very high resolution data more cheaply. Um, and they've got this great Skybox for Good program, which we've been able to um, engage with, where they are providing data for you know, philanthropic um, opportunities. This shows you Burning Man in um, last summer and Skybox just illustrating their ability to repeatedly get very high resolution measurements they can basically target over multiple days. And their constellation is growing. There's, there's other people in this space, as they say. So the, there's an explosion, especially of high resolution satellite data. And that's exciting from our standpoint because we can now go into places where we have actual some ground data and start testing. And these are four places that we've been, um, we're, we're starting to acquire through Skybox, through their Skybox for Good program that we're excited about. And in each of these, we have different um, uh, collaborators that are doing very detailed crop cuts or, or surveys that we can compare. You wanted me to stop five after, right? Is that right? Okay. So good. So I only have a couple minutes. So just in terms of what we are kind of doing over the next year or so is back to the analogy with, with education. So with these MOOCs, you have this great opportunity to randomize interventions. And that brings a lot of power in terms of advancing knowledge or understanding of, of what works. In, in agriculture, we, it's still an outdoor sport. So we can't kind of, I mean, there, there are robots involved. But there still is a lot of um, uh, things that we can't very easily monitor and get instant feedback on. But what we can do is partner with people who do randomized trials. There's, in the development community, there's all sorts of people doing randomized trials. And really monitoring impact is one of the big costs of those kind of trials. So with, with more kind of satellite-based or big data-based approaches to monitoring impact at the field level, it really enables this in kind of the same way that MOOCs enable randomized trials in education, but not quite. Uh, the, yeah, I'll skip this, merging of, of different types of data with, different types of satellite data with some of the other data sets is going to be um, a focus. And then I think in the kind of medium term to long term, what we'd like to do is be able to leverage this existing or this initial data sets that we can to try to attract the farmers and then get all sorts of more information from them that we can't hope to get otherwise. So last slide, um, or yes, last slide is, um, just kind of on the specifics of what are we in FSC actually looking for excited students or faculty to engage on. One is this issue of assets. So we have some places where we have actually good information on all sorts of things of uh, descriptors of household assets, including things like the household size and the roof type. And there's been a, some initial work in different places about how well can you actually automate an algorithm to go through this high resolution data and pick that up. Um, Stefano Aran, I don't know if he's here, but he's, um, He's one person that we're looking to do this, but we're, we're, he, he and us are looking for good students to engage on that. Um, and it doesn't have to just be roofs. I, you know, if you get repeated measurements, you can things, see things like livestock potentially moving around, which is livestock is one of the big assets in it's, it's livestock. Um, smart algorithms, algorithms for cloud shadow detection. Um, we, 
and I've talked to Yuri about this a little bit, we're really um, extremely novice at, at using some of the data sources that you guys are very experienced using. And so I think that's a big opportunity because, again, we do have in certain places some, some pretty nice data sets on things like local market food prices um, or local assets. Uh, and then finally, um, those of you who are into the world of developing apps, I think a really nice app would be one that very quickly interacts with all of the free imagery that's available now, maybe with some of the algorithms on top of them to interpret them, and then uses that as a, as a form for getting um, more data from farmers so that we can get to this point where we have massive data sets to work with. Um, I think like in all areas of data science, privacy is always going to be an issue. But I think in the long term, the benefits are just going to be um, justifying the, the types of personal risks that people might see. Uh, at least I could speak for myself. I'm not using any of this data for any means other than research. But um, I, I can understand the concerns there. But I think um, uh, you know, the, the potential there for getting data is, is enormous. And we should really take advantage of that if we can. So that's 505 or 506. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I I read a lot about Monsanto and how terrible they are and you know and what they do. And so what is the influence of capitalism and Western companies uh, to food security in third world countries? Positive, negative? What's the? Okay. Um, so I I think that it it um, it depends very much. I think that a lot of these companies are really. Um, getting much better about partnering in these countries, often licensing their products for free, um, helping researchers get trained. So there's lots of positives there. Um, and, I, and I think as these markets emerge, there's real business opportunities for these companies to engage. And, and the private sector is, you know, it's so essential, in a, in a, especially in a field where you've got thousands and thousands of individuals involved, that scaling up in the public sector is really just impossible. So you really need the private sector, and I think Peop, uh, groups like Monsanto or DuPont or Syngenta, they're, they're doing all sorts of good things. Um, there's just a more general issue here of, of the, um, I guess, the favorable environment in, in the rich world in terms of investing in agriculture, in terms of um, policies that favor agriculture or help support it, that you get um, into arguments about, you know, is the gap just widening and widening? It's hard for the, the the developing world to keep up. But I would say that, you know, certainly don't believe everything you read when it comes to um, uh, these countries, uh, these companies, and, and acting in different countries. But there's, there's always going to be heterogeneity in what the impacts are. So it's a kind of a bland answer. But they, they are helping to push data science forward. Um, they are helping to conquer some of these privacy concerns that are going to be a, an issue to tackle at some point. So that's all for the positive. Um, and hopefully they use it very wisely and, and don't, don't cause trust to be lost. In 20 years' time, when you have this product and you want to give it to smallholder farmers in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, let's say, what is the conduit going to be? I mean, how do, you mentioned sort of the distortionary impact of insurance items. So I wonder if you see like policy changes, players like Monsanto or, or, or any other. Well, in terms of, you know, I have little doubt that in 10 years time, smartphones are going to be ubiquitous even to the poorest level of the poorest farmer. So that kind of direct conduit, I think th there's already examples of that. For example, in India, there's this great um, NGO that has started basically filming farmers to make videos to instruct other farmers. It's like a peer-to-peer -peer training service. Uh, and this has taken off, and partly because it's surprising how much access the poorest farmers have to, to these digital media. Um, you know, as I always said to the last answer, I think the private sector at some level has to be involved for scaling up, and that's, you know, this is going to have to be a, a profitable enterprise. But um, beyond that, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I think, um, I think there's just huge opportunity. So I don't know how it's going to shake out. Yeah. What effect do you think drones will have in gathering data? Uh, in the future, and could you equip them with other senses like smell and wind? 
Great question. So the question's about drones. And you know, that, that's kind of a question about picking winners in the sense of there's lots of great ways to acquire data that are all getting better at the same time. So you've got these nano satellites or micro satellites that you're dropping by an order of magnitude the cost of satellite data. But drones are getting much cheaper as well. Um, and then you have all sorts of ground-based sensors that have opportunities. So sticking in, say, a soil moisture probe um, or doing some sort of ground-based kind of radar measurement or something like that. These are all progressing. Uh, if, I had, if I had to pick a winner right now, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm from the satellite camp in, in general just because of the scalability and the, and the um, I think there'll be all sorts of kind of privacy <coughs> issues with drones as much as or if more than with satellites. But no, I'm excited about drones. I think in, in the Bay Area, what you're seeing is lots of drone-based um, work right now because the satellites aren't quite there in terms of what they're measuring, how many sensors you can put up there. Right now, the, the micro satellites that I talked about that are cheaper are measuring very basic stuff like red and near-infrared reflectance, whereas drones are measuring thermal, um, all sorts of, they're doing LIDAR, they're doing fluorescence. So there'll be, always be a niche for that, but I think eventually those will all be in space as that technology gets better. Assuming there's not too much space down that people start over here. Yeah. yeah, assuming you like perfected all the data collection technology, like what is the magnitude of improvement in efficiency in agriculture? The maximum. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one that I ask myself and my students all the time, which is kind of the scariest question. Is like, what if this all works, then what? Um, and you, you've seen a lot of the discussion in, I don't know if you read The Economist or wherever, when they're talking about Monsanto and their new play on data, they're saying that they could get 5% yield gains, and that's a guess, I think. My sense is that it depends where you are. So. My sense is that in the rich world, what you're going to get is not so much the yield benefits as the input savings, that most farmers in the rich world are kind of risk averse on the side of losing yield. And so they actually apply lots of inputs to ensure that they get pretty high yields, although there still are lots of losses. So I think there is maybe a 5% yield gain. But what the real benefits will be is that there'll be 20 or 30% reductions in the amount of inputs of fertilizer, for example. And those will have huge cost savings and huge environmental benefits as much as productivity gains. But if you go, and then if you go to like the Chinas and the Indias of the world, uh, it's, it's both. It's, there's huge waste of inputs, but there's also huge yield losses as well. Um, they're basically just on a trajectory that takes a little while. And I think the opportunity there is huge in both cases. In the, um, in the poorest parts of the world, you know, I don't think it's too much to say that, well, I mean, I think it's clear agronomically you could double or triple yields. Um, but whether data science is going to be the critical factor in making that happen, I don't know. You'll notice in my title I said why data science might help feed the world. And it's because I'm not a, sale, a good salesman, I guess. But I think that you know, it's an open question still. But my experience has been that anytime I present a good data set there's, in an agricultural audience, there's five ways people think to use it that I haven't thought of. And so kind of in principle, I'm optimistic. Um, and if you look at the, just the amount of waste that goes on, the amount of yield losses that go on, all of that is in the farmer's interest to avoid. And, and I think with good financing models, maybe with providers that come in, um, I think that it, data could play a huge role in both targeting things and then also understanding just what should we be doing in these systems. We don't have the history of agricultural research experiments in, in Africa, say, that we have in the US. So. There's all sorts of opportunity, but that's a, a long-winded shrug at your answer. Like, I don't, I don't really know. It's a great question, though. Can you tell from the oh, no, Sorry. satellite data or other sources, a follow-up on the first question, yeah. whether there were genetically modified crops being used or not? That's such a big European versus others issue. Yeah, no, genetically modified crops are, are used quite a lot. They're about 15% of the crop land in the world. Um, they're used actually even more in developing countries than in, in developed, but they're used widely. Uh, and whether, in, in terms of from a data science perspective, you know, what's the overlap between genetic innovations and data science innovations? And I think they're kind of orthogonal, but there are some synergies in the sense that as we identify very um, uh, specific niches for certain traits with data science, that Genetic techniques kind of open up the, the possibility of doing that much more cost effectively, possibly. So, so genetic modification, uh, you know, is 
and I'm, maybe you've had talks from biologists, they're definitely in a big data science world themselves in terms of searching for like the, the genomic uh, patterns that associate with things that are favorable. So certainly data science within genetic modification is a big thing, but whether what I'm talking about here, which is really looking at agronomy and management of crops relative to the choice of genetically modified crops, uh, whether there's an interplay there, I'm not, not assured. Student or, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that there's a lot of satellite data from like America going back like several decades. Um, well, that's around the world, sorry. It's an American okay. satellite, but they've been acquiring from around the world. Okay, got it. Um, so I'm curious as to whether it's possible to use you know, insights from like decades ago, uh, even though there's been like a lot of change in the environment, like climate change and things like that. It's, like, yeah. It's still valid or? Yeah, so there's, there's this uh, trade off of you go back further in time, you're less and less relevant for today in some ways. So it, you know, it depends on the application. I think for things like understanding crop rotations, getting a nice five year history is enough and that's really useful. Um, for things though, like understanding where should we be targeting interventions uh, to improve soil or to avoid degradation of soil, that you need kind of a longer term understanding of what's going on. And I think that's, that's an example where you, you would benefit from the longer time horizon. There's also big questions that we are interested in in terms of how, how much is it really the farm itself and the farmer itself. Um, and if you can look over a long period of time, you can really get a sense, just like if you look at a, a mutual fund manager over one year, you know, they could do really well in one year. They might even do really well over three years. But if you have a 10 year history, you can really start to understand the role of luck versus the role of skill and how much we should expect skill to improve things. Because a lot of this data science is about getting more skill. And if you have a sense looking over time how important skill is, you can get a sense to answer this question that was asked about that. So there are, there are roles, but your, your point is exactly right, which is that you don't want to go back to 1970 and, and, and think that you're studying current crops, current techniques. All right, good. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.